So here's a great example of an unfinished wide body. So we're in our pre-wire and they're starting to run their wire looms. This would have just come over from the welding shop and the paint shop. So the body's all attached, it's all welded together. You can see the type of structure that we're putting in here that's a steel structure. And these steel roofs, our ribs are welded to the sidewalls, the sidewalls welded to the floor, which is underneath the linoleum, and this makes it one massive strong unit. Also a great example here is we put in this light ply we were talking about earlier. So this is precisely cut and fit in here so that when they mount this window, there's no room for that window to ever shift once it's installed. Plus, there's no mistakes as to where you're gonna cut the hole for the window. It's all dedicated space, and when it goes in and they get screwed in, there's absolutely no chance of that ever shifting. Versus? Versus, fair, a lot of times they might have a little strip of blocking and it might be floating in the wall, so they have something to screw the window to the trim ring inside, but we fix it right in between our steel structure, so there's no way that piece is ever gonna shift when you're driving down the road. I see. Plus, we have a five-year warranty on what we construct, so I gotta make sure that window isn't gonna shift in year two or year three, which creates leaks. Nobody likes water leaks. So this is an example, I think this is a great question people have, like when you say a five-year warranty, this is the type of thing that you have to be thinking about when you're gonna be giving a five-year warranty. And we warranty all of the work that we do in the construction process. So from building the steel walls and attaching the fiberglass, we warranty that all for five years. We install the windows, we warranty that installation for five years. We warranty all of our plumbing, all of our electrical. So there's a lot involved in a warranty and there's nothing worse than having a failure on the road and then having somebody ruin their vacation uh, while they wait to get something fixed. So we only get one chance to build a motorhome. We're best served to do it right the first time. So your soup, what would be called the superstructure warranty on this model would be five years. Five years. In addition to what, the coach warranty. The, right. right. Everything is five years. And I'm noticing Dean as well. <clears throat> these, are, these are the steel uh, beams that we saw before being assembled for the roof, the roof cap, right. which is yeah. welded. But in addition, I'm seeing also wood up here yeah, as well we run, for support. Yeah, wood trusses as well. So that's part, we're gonna be able to attach our headliners into this. Um, it adds more strength to it. I mean, like, it's overkill, there's no doubt. We could probably do with less, but we know over our years of experience that this is gonna give you a rock solid coach and it's gonna be very safe in the long run. Okay, but these are not, I mean, if you didn't have these up here, would you still be able to kind of attach the things that you need to attach? Yeah, we would. We still need, we still have some wood blocking in place that you're going to attach the headliners to, but it, it's just a better quality job. You'll also notice our insulation. That's one thing that comes up all the time, how well insulated. So here we use one inch styrofoam board in the walls. It's just getting placed in here now. It's cut and fit in between all the little pieces. And as an example, we also have fiberglass insulation that we put up in the roof. So it gives you a little reflective to keep heat and cool in, and it's also fairly thick fiberglass insulation. So this is the reflective, so this is just gonna keep the heat in or reflect the heat back out. Yes. In addition to your fiberglass. Right. right. And what's also interesting, you know, that's a big question, insulation. How much insulation is required? How much do I really need? Well, it's to keep heat out and, or heat in depending on your season. But really, we're looking at 160 square feet. With our furnace and the air conditioning, it heats up really quickly and it cools down very quickly. So you don't need really fancy, super expensive, high-end insulation packages because the appliances take care of it so efficiently. So Neil, this is our pre-wire and our electrical department. This is where we uh, put all our wiring harnesses together and then they go and they install them into each coach. So what are these two things set up in front of us? So two things, this is part of the wiring harness. And again, you can see here's the serial number. That's the coach that it's going into. It's destined to go to the US. So when the electricians come to do the pre-wiring, they look, they find their bundle, and this is part of that package. Now this is part of our multiplex wiring harness. So this goes from our 
uh, DC load center, and it'll run up into the roof to a hub for all of our lighting. So to give you an idea of the savings that we get for using multiplex, it would be equivalent prior to about that much wire it would take is now this much wire. Wow, okay, so this much wire was pretty hefty yeah. here. And this is just for one harness is replaced with just this. Yeah, so we're gonna save about 40% in weight overall. Plus it eliminates a bunch of connections and it makes it an easier process to install. So from the wood shop where we saw all the pieces being cut, they get packaged up and brought over to the main production facility and they're put in all of these bins. So an installer will come, he'll find his piece and then he'll take it and install it. So here you can see there's Dwayne, the installer, serial number 206 and it's for his RAM FL. This is his lower portion of the upper cabinet. We also have other packs that are all here. Each piece has got a serial number and they all come to each bin and they get the part when they need it through the course of their production. So what's the uh, advantage, Dean, of do using this process? It, A, there's no mistakes in grabbing the wrong part and installing it in the wrong van. So it cuts down on any kind of mistakes like that. Plus, it's very organized and it simplifies and speeds up the installer. He knows I'm coming, I'm looking for my serial number and my package of goods, then I'll go and install it. So this shrink rack package here, that's for one installer. We got the serial number here. So this is all for one installer. Yep, he'll come and that, that's for one part of the process. So all these bins will have different segments of the construction process from the kitchen to the bathroom, whatever parts they need. And again, they're all numbered, so there's no mistakes. So this is our main installation building, and these are all of our installers. So we have two sides of the row. We're going to have a 14, 15 vans in production in installation bays the entire time. And what we do is called stall installation. So there are a series of stalls on both sides of the building here where there'll be one specific cabinet installer that's going to build all the cabinetry inside so the vehicle doesn't move, it stays stationary, and all the other trades, the plumbers, the electricians, the gas fitters, they all rotate to the van, do their work, and rotate through to the next one. So there'll be one cabinet, for instance, uh, builder that will be assigned to this particular van that we're looking at right now. Yeah, this is Bart's van, this is his stall, and Bart will build this coach, all the cabinets, from start to finish. So we're looking inside this, it looks like an ascent right now. This is an ascent, yeah. And what stage of completion are we looking at here? So this is about two days into the build. And you can see here that there's a center line drawn on the floor. So when the installer starts, he marks out a center line and then he's gonna start building from the front the way back. So he's gonna score up his front wall partition of the bathroom and then he's going to start working his way back so everything is square and fits as he goes. And so explain to me like how this differs from you know most of us are familiar with assembly lines right so how is this different than a, an assembly line built RV? So most typical assembly line we'll use a travel trailer as an example, it's going to roll down a line and there's all the cabinets are going to be prefabricated and there's going to be a bunch of people running around putting in their one thing and then leaving. So there's going to be multiple people putting stuff, attaching it, and then the walls come up last. Since we have a fixed product with the walls up first, we build from the inside out versus the outside in. So because of the unique shape of the van, every piece we feel for us needs to be fit and, and it's a custom shape. So instead of, you'll see in here, the wall partition is one piece. Each one on the passenger side, those are all individual pieces that fit to the unique shape of the side wall and then they all get screwed together. Versus an assembly line, they might wheel that whole piece down and stick it in and then when the wall comes up, we just hope it fits. So if this were theoretically being built on an assembly line, the cabinets and things would be built outside the van? Outside the van. And then they would bring it in and they would attach it all in? And they would just attach it. I see. So this is more like new home construction where we are building each piece individually by one person, not a bunch of people that are building it. We once tried to uh, have multiple installers 
build a unit where one would build the front and one would build the back. But each craftsman is unique in kind of the styles that they have. And at the end of the day, you couldn't marry the two together. So we found it to be efficient. And from a quality standpoint, having one person build that one van is by far superior. So that's why we see, I mean, it's amazing to me, but I asked you, why, what are these pencil markings like on the actual floors and things? That's precisely what they're going to line up to for this particular van. And that, and that could vary between vans? There's no, the, the only thing that varies in a van really is the walls could change a little bit. So when we have a, a wall panel, it may not fit 100% off of the router. So sometimes we have to trim them so that we get that really tight fit. But once that front wall partition is set in place, everything has to be exactly where it goes. You can see that, you know, we run some holes through the floor in the, in the plumbing for the lines to go through. Well, there's no, it could be over here. It has to be exactly there. So each part of that cabinet has to be exact and precise. And so how long then will it stay in this bay? Uh, in this stall, it's gonna be about four days. So that craftsman will build that interior over that span of four days. The plumbers will come through, the electricians will come through, all of it will get built right here in one spot. And then so up until this point, this particular van, from when it arrived outside just a completely empty shell and then it came into your facility, how long has it been since that point to this point? It's three weeks to get it to here. Just, it's been three weeks. Three weeks. Just to get through. it to here. Yep, that's going through the welding shop, the paint shop, pre-wire, subfloor, all that process is three weeks to here. And then from this point then, how long until it's gonna roll out and be shipped out to a dealer? Completely finished, another three weeks. So, so we're midway through at this point. We're midway through, it's a six week process. Amazing. So we're so close to the finish line, I can look around the corner. Yep. And that's the finish line, but you're telling me to get from here to there is another three weeks. Yep, it's gonna be another three weeks. Through all that, it's gonna go through flooring, which will be in there for a few days, we have drapery, we'll see all these other departments, but that is part of the process. Now assembly lines, they can be much quicker, but at the end of the day, we're accountable to people like you, the owners, and we're comfortable with the way we build it and the quality that we're gonna achieve. Because again, we're gonna back this for five years. So we need it to be built right the first time. So in, here in this coach, Neil, uh, this one is about day three and a half. And as you can see, most of the cabinets are already installed. The plumbers are coming through and we're about to hook up our lithium batteries and finalize our electrical system. So this is the Eco Ion system that is standard, right? Across yes. all of Pleasure Ways models. What are we looking at here? Like what, can you just do a little explanation of the components and things like that? Sure, so several years ago, um, our standard in our coach was one 12 volt lead acid 100 amp hour coach battery. And then when we did our research on lithium batteries, we now provide as standard two 100 amp hour lithium batteries. So you basically, this is the equivalent of four lead acid batteries, but it's reduced the weight substantially because as you can see there, that's yeah. a light battery. Yep. Like in the realm of batteries. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to pick a lead acid. much, no. So you gain, we've upgraded to really good batteries. These batteries have their own built-in battery management system. So when they're fully charged, they turn themselves off. Because they're lithium iron phosphate, there's no thermal runaway concerns, not like the cell phones on airplanes, right? That doesn't happen. These are completely safe. We mount them in their own trays, they're secure, and all of our wiring is designed based on 200 amp hours. And so these are also completely sealed, right? I mean, there's no off-gassing. Nope, this is all a completely sealed battery. Self-contained, manages itself. It does no it all, worry. it protects itself from overcharging. It'll, uh, it'll turn itself off before you can, can completely deplete it. It's gonna be good for, you know, two to 3,000 cycles. So if you just think about it, if you had these two batteries and you were a hundred days, you lived in your coach and every day you killed your batteries and charged it up, which is really hard to do, you're gonna be good for 20 years on these batteries. So you're saving money in the long run, you're not gonna have to replace these batteries and they're a standard 
feature in our coach, not a really expensive upgrade. And I notice that you obviously have the battery box here inside the coach, the cabin itself. Yeah. Why is it? Uh, this is to keep the batteries warm. So if you're traveling through cold weather, you don't have to worry about heating pads, if they're mounted up underneath. That just adds a, a layer of complexity and power drain that you don't really need. As long as your coach is warm inside, your batteries are warm inside, you're not gonna have an issue. Plus, lithium batteries, you shouldn't charge them when it's below freezing, but they can discharge all day long up to minus 20. So it's just on the charging side that you wanna be careful, but not many people are really put in that position. So a question I've had uh, on my ascent when I lived in Quebec mm -hmm. in the winter, right, is I had to monitor on my own. I had to actually uh, install a temperature gauge inside the battery compartment okay. to make sure that the temperature was high enough so I could charge them. Right. Uh, so are there any plans for you guys? Does the, I assume the BMS doesn't. It's not smart enough to. There's no temperature sensor inside of it, so it doesn't know when it's below freezing. No, it doesn't. Um, so yeah, typically the gauges, if, you're, if your coach is warm inside, it's, it's going to be warm enough. But as an example, they, the company that we get these batteries from, so part of their testing process for us is they took this battery, they stuck it in a deep freeze, they brought it down below freezing, they discharged it below freezing, and then they charged it below freezing 400 times. Okay, after 400 times, the battery showed signs of dramatic wear. I don't think anybody is going to charge frozen batteries 400 times in the normal course of use of an RV. So if you ever got caught once and maybe it was below, it's, it's the odds are you're not really gonna damage it. Plus, if your batteries are fully charged when you put them away, they're gonna turn themselves off. So you can't really accidentally charge them. Plus, we also have a charge line disconnect, so you can turn off your solar and you can turn off your engine alternator charge to it. So if it was really cold out and you had to get from point A to point B and you're worried about accidentally charging your batteries, you can just disconnect the charge line and you're completely safe. Yeah, that's what I would always do. So the best practice is if you're in really cold weather, then just simply don't charge up the batteries until it reaches yeah, until cabin it's, temperature. Yeah. But if you miss it and now and then occasionally, it's nothing to panic about. The batteries aren't gonna suddenly stop working. No. It's fine, they've been tested up to 300 cycles of being charged yep. uh, under you know, freezing temperatures. Yep. And They're fine. It's a high quality, good lithium battery. Great, that clears things up for me, thanks. Great. So this is our flooring department, Neil. So as you saw previously, when we were, where they were putting down the subfloor, well, now that the coach has come out of the installer's bay, it comes into our flooring department. Here they're going to lay the lino and put down the carpet and some of the drapery stuff. But here, where they had screwed the floor down, now we've patched it. So once that's dry, it's going to get sanded before we glue the lino down. And you're not going to have any divots. It's going to be a smooth, flat surface underneath. So each one of these holes here, so these have been puttied in and of course, you didn't need to do that, right? You didn't have to putty it in. And then you're going to sand it all down. Yep. And then the lino will go on top of that. Yes. So that's, and we're going to glue it down. Um, you know, some RVs are built where they just take the lino goes down first. It gets stapled down. Sometimes they glue it. But if you don't glue it down, it can shift over time. And crack is a, is a byproduct of that. So we always glue it down so that we know we're not going to have a problem. Something else I'm going to show you. This is the, the lino that we use. It's pretty thick. Yeah. So that's what Pleasureway uses. And this is an example of what the industry uses. So there's, you know, a lot of cost savings to be had in here. But this is something that will tear very easily. It's not going to wear. That is a household high-end type of linoleum that's going to last a long time. Does this provide any additional kind of sound insulation? It would and it's also a little bit more you know softer it's on your feet to be honest because yeah. there's there's nothing in here. Yeah yeah I dropped a, a very heavy piece of camera equipment on my linoleum in my ascent and it definitely dented it but it, it came right back out of it. Yeah yeah that's again it's just a testament to the quality of products that we're putting in a quality built unit.
So once they come out of the installer's bay and they've gotten the flooring, this is kind of a finishing line here. So as we go along, they're gonna hang, all the cabinet doors start to get finished. This is where they're gonna, you know, put in the drapery. They're gonna get it to the point that chairs are going back in. This just moves along very quickly up into the final position where we do all our testing. So we're gonna do propane tests, water tests, electrical diagnostic tests. We're gonna run the appliances, make sure they're all working before it goes into our final QC. So once a van enters this line, how close is it to being completed? Now we're, this is gonna flow through in about four days. Now that sounds like a lot of time because it's gonna move ahead, but it's gonna be a day or two in quality control while they check things. And if we find any rework, it's gonna go back out to a different department and then always comes back in for a final wash and clean. So this is pretty close to complete yeah. at this point. Yeah, it is almost 100% complete. Again, we're just gonna do our testing. We're gonna start cleaning and washing it. And then we hand it over to QC. What are the, I noticed like the trim pieces are still missing the front grill things like that when do those get put on those get put on once it's through it'll go back to the body shop and all those panels will get put back on then it'll come back in for one final look over is that just for like extra safety precaution just it is we don't want to damage those painted moldings you saw the amount of effort it takes right. to paint them we don't want to put them on too soon in case you know accidents do happen right so this is the uh, the, the coach itself the interior the build out is completed pretty much yep. it's ready to go into final prep clean yep. up and then quality yeah we'll go back at the running boards put on the moldings will go put on and it's pretty much done so we're in an ascent just like yours neil and this has our multiplex wiring and our new touch screen control panels you know dean um I have a question from some of my viewers about multi multiplex wiring. Yep. I personally love it in my ascent. I like having the control panels and the ability to just control everything there, it cleans everything up. But the concern is, and they wanted me to ask you, multiplex wiring, if something goes wrong with it, like how difficult or easy is it to get it repaired? Their concern is that it's more complicated than traditional wiring. Do you have any thoughts on like, what can you tell us? Yeah, part of the process of switching to multiplex wiring is the ease of troubleshooting. So because you've reduced the number of wires and the number of connections, there's less places for it to fail. Plus with multiplex wiring, like as an example on our touch screen, we can uh, go to the diagnostics page. Here it's gonna give you a general overview of everything that's going on. This is our 12 volt DC center load panel. So green lights mean that that's an open active switch like for lights. If there's a problem, it's gonna show a red light. And if you have a real problem, you're gonna to go to the faults page and it's gonna specifically tell you what the issue is. So now with older wiring, where we didn't have multiplex, if you had a, a problem with your electrical system, that tech has no idea where to start. Here, it'll literally tell you what the problem is. And from there, he knows exactly where to troubleshoot. So it, it speeds up the whole repair situation. So in, before you move to multiplex wiring, same problem if there were a problem, what would have to happen? Like, would they just start have to just tearing things out? You'd to try literally to find... start tracing wires to see if there's a short or a dead in it. And you start involving removing cabinets and walls and digging in. We're here now because we reduce those number of wires. It's if there ever is an issue and nothing is perfect, but it's usually going to be something that is easy to fix because the less. So we have our DC load center here. Most of the 12 volt breakers are resettable. So if it trips, it'll just reload itself and turn on. Plus we also have these are manual ones. So if it trips, you know exactly which one it is. You just push it back down and away you go. But it would also show up here. It would show up there too. So both places, you yep. could just come up here, take a look at it. If it needs reset, you could just go down there and yep. reset it. That's it. Okay. So this is our quality control department. So this is where our two inspectors, Blair, who's been here for 29 years, and Chris has been here for 24. They do all the final inspections of all the units produced. So we have a series of checklists that each installer or the plumber or the electrician, as they work through, they, as you can see, they, they write down all the work they've done, they check it, they sign off on it, and then our QC guys check all their work. 
So they will go through and if there's any what we call a deviation or something that needs to be corrected, they'll go back onto the floor, get the person that's responsible, whether it's an installer or a plumber, and they're gonna come back and they're gonna correct the deviation. We have everybody sign off on the work that they do. This helps make everybody accountable for the job they're performing. There's a lot of stuff on this list now. I think it's to your credit, Dean, but I don't see any little marks on the sides of these particular vans. It's not to say it doesn't happen, right? No, no, it, and it happens, right? Okay. Things happen all the time, and you don't have one of the lowest warranty rates in the entire industry uh, without really checking stuff over. So we're gonna find those things so that our customers don't have to have any issues down the road. But yeah, we're gonna find stuff, and, and we have to, because it, it just serves our purpose. Yeah, I noticed before when we were going through, you explained to me, you know, there was, are there different colored markers for yeah, different Yeah, so we use um, blue grease pens for any flaws in paint that we might see that need to be addressed. We use red stickers wherever, inside or outside, if we have to change something or tighten something up, whatever the deviation is, it's gonna be marked, it's gonna be noted, and then that person, after they correct it, they sign off on that too. So we know that when this coach is done, it's up to our standard. And so let's, if we see like a blemish or something on the paint, what has to happen from here? What happens? So from here, if there is a blemish in the paint, it's gonna go back to the paint shop, they're gonna correct it, it's gonna come back in here again, and it's gonna get another inspection. They'll make sure that that's all taken care it's of. It's all taken care of. And then from here, like these lucky units here, if, there's, if it passes quality control, what happens? Then from here, we're going to, uh, the, all of our units get trucked to their final destination. So through our process and our test drive and everything that we do, there's usually around 100 miles on it, but that's all. So that the owner actually gets to break in the vehicle himself. So they all get trucked to their final destinations. Is that always the case? I mean, is that something we should be aware of when we're buying an RV? Do, do, does everyone truck their units to no, the dealer? No, not at all. Uh, we truck predominantly because of our location, but a lot of motorhomes are typically driven in the United States. So that's just how their delivery service works. We just want that customer to get you know, a unit with very little mileage on. It's a big investment. Right. So we want them to have the pleasure of first driving it. Great. So Neil, that wraps up our tour. What'd you think? I was beyond impressed. Um, I learned a lot from you and it confirmed a lot of things that I knew was the case, but you had to come here. I had to come here in person to see it. And I wanna thank you and your crew for opening up your entire facility to me. That was one of the things I asked for and you did, you opened it completely up and you made yourself available to answer every single one of my questions and my viewers' questions. So I wanna thank you for that. Well, that's great. It's a pleasure having you. And you know, we can tell you how good things are, but until you see it yourself, it, there's no amount of detail we can get into to truly appreciate what you've seen today. So I'm glad you see it and I'm glad it reaffirms your, your faith in us. One last thing I wanna show you, cause this is a real treat for us. Uh, literally two days ago before you got here, we tracked down our third ever built unit. So we acquired number two ever, which was the first production piece. This is our second production unit ever built. It was in July of 1986. I'll let you have a look at it, but as you can see, that's all original, 33 years old. Oh my gosh, this is number three. Three. Off of your production. production. So we had our, our prototype and then unit one and unit two. So we called this one three. Is this all original that I'm looking that at? That is all original. So this is how, so what is this? 33 years old. 33 years old. This is the upholstery, the woodwork, the cabinetry. Everything. <laughs> That's amazing. Stands up to the test of time. You know what's funny, Dean? When I look inside of this incredible piece of your history, it's amazing. I can see the linking back of your heritage and your history. I can see elements of my ascent in this original number three build that came off of your, out of your facilities. This was the cornerstone that, that built our company, built the quality to get to where we are today. And you know, it's a, it's a thrill for me. It's a thrill for our family to find it. It's a big piece of our heritage. Well, that's a testament 
to you guys the fact that 33 years later, here it is back at home yep. at Pleasure Way. And it's looking in <laughs> remarkable shape. Remarkable shape. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And thanks again, Neil, for coming. I appreciate your time. Thank you.